of death and the women they are dealing with and the women are often they go from being clothed to very quickly having all their clothes taken off and um, it's amazing how what you, what this tells us about the human race oh, yeah. <laughs> so um, this cranky tonight is death and the lady and uh, we'll get to it okay so when I was falling asleep a few nights ago I really thought that I didn't like the way I had I planned the opening for this talk. It was a, a terrible treatise. Well, that's me asleep looking very large, and that's Eleanor Roosevelt the cat. <laughs> she rules the neighborhood. Um, so I, I, did, I planned this long treatise on crankies, and I thought, well, that's kind of a fair, unless you guys are planning to get PhDs in the subject. You didn't need all that information. And so on reflection, it seemed unkind, and I went to sleep thinking, maybe I'll get an idea in my dream. <laughs> and then I woke up in the morning, and I didn't get an idea in my dream. <laughs> Instead, I dreamed that I was at the top of our beloved local library, which conveniently had this tall, tall tower, like City Hall Tower. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you can imagine the view from up there. It was crazy. And I looked out the window, and I noticed that the river, which I could see a long green Vermont Valley, and there was a roadway coming along the river, and the river was mysteriously rising, and the cars on the roadway were suddenly being forced to drive through some deep and treacherous looking areas. And then in a week, the water reached our town, and I ran downstairs to warn the library patrons and the staff that something was happening. And so behind us, as we fled back up the stairs to the tower, the water was lapping at our heels. Oh. Oh. That's the reading room at the library. This was a shocking, shocking dream. And so in dreams, the absurdities go unnoticed, which is very interesting thing, but because it, it makes the anxiety you feel for very pure and indescribable. And then when you wake up, you think, why were you so upset? Why were you so afraid? But in the dream, it, it is. That's just how dreams are. And in this dream, so much was under threat. It was beyond my comprehension that the library and all our books and our community and our landscape and this is a painting called Vermont Flooding by a man named James Yarganzor. And uh, I don't know how to say that. But I was worried about my daughters, who are suddenly small children out there somewhere. And then I had a lot of worries about my cell phone. Why is it worried about my cell phone? But it was a worry. And then the dream, luckily, at the top of the library, there was a, 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 some sort of riverboat. <coughs> the captain and things got better then. But I was still worried. And all in entangled in these sort of miseries of this dream were the bargains of the sort we all know. That if I get out of this, I promise I'll be a better person. <laughs> and then I woke up. And as you see, I am a better person. <laughs> in my dream because it seemed so strangely real. And so I snapped on the news, and there was a PBS announcer, um, Judy Woodruff. She was sitting there looking very prim as she does, and behind her was a shoreline photograph of whatever she was going to be talking about. And on the screen, behind her, there were very large letters saying, rising water. And that made me feel like I was in some sort of mystery trap, you know, where things are answering themselves. And so, in fact, did I dream what needs to be increasingly and, incon and inconveniently said? And that's what the children today were marching about. That, that dream is exactly what Death and the Lady, the ballad that we're get is about tonight, mm -hmm. what that ballad is about. It's about the bargains one makes when your world is under threat. Mm -hmm. And the ballad theme was immensely popular from 1300 to 1400, and then again in 1600 to 1700, it was even in operas and operettas, this, but the theme has dominated a whole bunch of artists for a long time. 
So all from people from all over the world are interested in this theme. Here's a Hungarian guy who's painting this. They're whitewashing the smoke, right? It's an interesting painting. And, um, but there, people are focusing on this in a lot of ways. I think a lot of people have a, a kind of a permanent sense of discomfort about whatever's going on in our world. And, and that is something that bothers me. And because we know that we're under slow but escalating threats, and they're threats to our own finite world, our own lives, plus the larger background concerns. And unlike some cultures who have a word for your environment that has changed, one word that says how much you miss your changed environment. But we don't have that in our language. And so we, it's hard to express what, we're, what we feel. We just live with a sense of impending loss. Here's a, a picture about the fire in California by an artist there named Marion Estes. And obviously, people who lived through that fire last year was it last year? Yes. Uh, are permanently in a state of anxiety about what that did to their world. One of my daughters lived six miles from that fire, and it, 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 it's changed her in many, many ways. Um, and the next one is about just general impending loss. And it, it, it's hard to see, it's hard to read, but there are little soldiers down here. So it's about war and, and change. And so all these pictures, there are many, many of them. And uh, they all are about unwelcome changes. And with the ballad of this evening, one is reminded that people have endured these fears for a long, long time. Their problems were different, but they must have felt just as ominous to them. All right, so when I was in college, Paul Ehrlich's Population Bomb came out. And it was published, what, in 67 or something like that. And we got our first hint in print that there was a rough road ahead. And um, we worried. And in the case of many young people, there's my sister Charlotte. That's Stacy. Can you see him? There's Termite the dog. They went everywhere on the, around carrying their instruments and just making music everywhere. And that was their way that they dealt with what was how they felt about the world. They just opted out of the lives that had been expected of them. And so did I to a lesser extent. We made gardens, we made art, we I, I acted like a seeing eye dog for my friends who were stoned all the time. I just wasn't a person who liked to get stoned, but I didn't mind leading them around. They became very interesting when they were out of their minds. <laughs> and we sang. We sang lots of music, and there was a lot of wildness to soothe our spirits. And so around then, I met this boy, a tall, handsome boy. And we shacked up in an actual shack. It was really a shack. You can see it right there. We lived there for four years. And there we were, sort of happy. We were both in school. And in my spare time, I painted. I always have been a secret painter. Uh, Thank you. And there are these odd spies. There's a runner, runner ducks walking through a mystery. And the mystery, of course, is the, the mystery of the birth of, of Christ. And, uh, and then I painted other little things, strange things, and, and that here's a wo little woman trying to get up this stairway that's going, it's, it's, a, it's not women aren't allowed up that staircase, so she's run a ladder up, and she's going to go up there. And the paintings were strange, and mostly have, I, they've all disappeared, I don't know where they are. But I also made clay whistles, which I learned from my mother. Here's a whole wall of clay whistles that are the story of Noah. And they, you, can ha you have to get up close and blow in. The, each one has little whistles sticking out of it. Wow. But it was a wonderful, wonderful thing. I did that for Fred and Puppet one, one of those when the su summer circuses were huge. And that was in the pine forest. Here's one hard to see. But it's, uh, it's a Noah's Ark with two huge dinosaurs that have taken up all the room. And poor little Noah and his wife are trying to push them off. There's no room for anybody else. So they, I guess they get rid of them because we don't have them now. <laughs> and we don't have all the other animals. Anyway, so in addition to doing those sort of things, we sang. We sang all the time. And the music that was played and sung in that little shack was mostly old-time music from the hillbilly countryside that I grew up in. It were songs that were learned from old-timers whose ancestors had crossed the Ohio River, and they cleared the little for the forested hills, and they built log cabins, and they farmed on this really thin, bad soil. And uh, they sang, and they'd, as they they come in from Kentucky, and the 
the speech patterns and the music was very, very like Kentucky and the same type of music. It's still, it's part of greater Appalachia uh, in, in musical terms. And two related songs I heard at a singing party in that little house. And they've never left me, those two songs. And uh, they were both conversations between the singer, the, the voice of the, in the ballad, and death. And they're sung as conversations, which was a very popular form of music in the 1300s. The origins of both songs have long vanished. The songs still persist. But one was O Death, and it's really grimly phrased, and it's unforgettable. And the other was Death and the Lady, which is a more refined song, or song tonight, but equally stark. I didn't learn it in the tune that I now sing. I, the, the tune I learned was completely forgettable, and when I heard Norma Waterson sing it, her tune went into my head, and I completely jumped the old, other one. So O Death, which was... The first of all, I, should I sing a little bit of it so you recognize it? Okay, yeah. let's see. Mm. I'll bind your feet so you can't walk. I'll hush your mouth so you can't talk. I'll blind your eyes so you can't see. This very outcome go with me. Oh, death, oh, death, oh, bear me over for another year. And it goes on like that with these really frightening kind of threats. And the person saying, please give me another year. And that's a real typical conversation with death song. Okay. And O oh, Death was claimed to have been written by Lloyd Chambers. There he is. I don't know what he's doing on that big rock. But he was an itinerant preacher who said that he wrote that song in 1920 when he was recovering from a bender. His family all agreed that it was so. They said he'd been drinking white lightning and he woke up singing this song, so it was his song. I haven't we all had that happen that you wake up from a bender on white lightning and <laughs> just happen to sing a song that is ancient and no one's ever sung it before? <laughs> you know, um, yeah, the only thing really standing in the way with his, with his claim was that other people were already singing this song. <laughs> they just happened to be black people who were singing this song. From the, there's uh, Bessie Jones from the Georgia Sea Islands, and she sang that song for Alan Lomax. It was called Death in the Morning. But it's essentially the same talk, song. It's a conversation of the very similar words. And not only were the people from the Georgia Sea Islands singing that song, but they were singing it in many, many versions and many styles. And I think it takes time for that many individual song variants to rise up. But Lloyd Chambers still gets the credit in some academic circles, mm -hmm. and that's how I feel about that. <laughs> <laughs> and his family is still trying to get, to get royalties for anyone singing that song. Oh. And they haven't been successful as far as I know, but uh, they're trying. Okay, so adding to this muddled situation, some scholars say that Odeth is a variant of a much earlier song. And that much earlier song happens to be the one, other one I learned in that little house and the subject of tonight's talk. And that song is Death and the Lady. And she has very mysterious past and a history which easily extends back to the Middle Ages, although there's not any proof particularly of that. It's just people believe it. And I believe it. These songs were passed by word of mouth, and they changed as they went. But when printing became cheap, Around 1400, paper and printing became cheap enough that people could have, buy up printed copies. And this would be a, a host. She's holding a whole bunch of ballads hung over her arm. And you can see how hard it is to be a seller of a singer and seller of ballads on the street. He's pretending that he has a wooden leg, but he's got his leg tucked up behind. And they've got pox on their faces that they seem to have marked on there. And so it must have been a rough go. But they're, they're trying to sell these ballads on the street. And with that, many old songs were revived, and they were taken up and reworked and polished and printed, and then ridiculous flowery language got added to many of them. And, um, and many fine old ballads got turned into things that kind of make your hair curl. But Death and the Lady was one of those. The later broadsides from the 1700s of Death and the Lady were very, very extreme. Um, Oh, this is another broadside seller. He's got broadside music here, 
And uh, this is one of the Bruegels, younger or older, I don't know which. And then he's selling also paper crowns that you have to cut out that you wear for the Feast of the Bean King, which is January 6th, the old, old Christmas. And that's a big feast where somebody gets crowned king and gets to order everybody else around for the rest of the night. I recommend reviving that holiday. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, she, when the broadsides came out, Death and the Lady was written down for the first time, at least the first time that is has survived. And she was sold as a broadside, printed song and lyrics, on the street for next to nothing. And broadsides became the new way to learn a song. It used to always be part of the oral tradition. Now it was a, a, liter a literary thing that you could, they could both sing them on the street, but they also sold them on the street as a written form. And that was a big change in the way, the beginning of a big change in the way music was transmitted. And um, so now we have to back up, because we have to back up to the days when Death and the Lady was fresh and new. And here's uh, one of, from the Book of Hours of, of Duke de Barry, I guess it is. Yes, here's winter. They're warming themselves at a fire. And it's all the aspects of their life and the calendar year. And it's a little book like this. You can get beautiful reproductions of it. And it's a lovely, lovely thing to look at. And it shows the years after 1300. And those years were very hard in the British Isles. They had a mini ice age. And that damaged crops and caused famines. And it was a time of enormous fear and turbulence of wars and, and unrest of the population. And the ultimate horror was the plague. The Black Death hit Great Britain in 1348. And up to half the population died in a year. And so whole families, whole villages just vanished. Here's some people lolling around in bed. They don't look like they feel so good. They've got these big, strange lumps on them that says it's probably not the plague. They probably have smallpox, but we don't have, a di well, have to diagnose them. They were from 700 years ago. But it shows sort of <laughs> how, I don't know what this person's doing up there. He's maybe dispelling the evil vapors, maybe. I don't know, but it was a, it was a terrible time for people. And, and they, uh, it became the topic of a great deal of art in, in illuminated manuscripts and in all kinds of forms. And um, in, the, in this time, it was the first time, as far as I know, that the personification of death became necessary. If you're going to draw a picture of people being taken by death, what does death look like? And so was, it, was he male? Yes, most everybody seemed to think that it was a male. Was it a cadaver? Was it a skeleton? The Grim Reaper, the Grim Reaper didn't really come until later, except, except the guy with the scythe was early. But that whole thing, you know, the hourglass and the, all that, that's later. But the, the pictures that started off tended to be of death leading everybody you ever cared about, taking them by the hand and, and leading them away in a long line. And the plague returned again and again. Uh, this is a dance of death, these pictures are called, and it's from a church that was in Germany somewhere and it was bombed during the war. But in this church, the entire wall was a frieze all the way around you of people from every walk of life dancing with skeletons. And, being, and, and that, was, that was the motif of the dance of death. Since the plague returned again and again on its own schedule, you never knew there was this helpless terror of that you never knew what was going to happen. And this collective response of this obsessive art with this dance of death theme allowed cheap prints that ordinary people could afford would be printed up of things like this. Now these guys look really jolly. They're having a great time. They're dancing. The dance of death hasn't quite gotten so grim as it maybe gets later. But uh, they have music. You know, if I don't know what he's doing over there. Oh, he's dancing too, he or she. But um, they're just dancing. They're really not menacing anybody yet. And some of you might recall the Bergman film, The Seventh Seal. I don't know whether, but that is the last scene in that movie. And it's unforgettable scene where, and in the movie, the night is a movie about, about the plague leaves, the years. So it's probably from, you know, 1300s. And uh, it, the, the knight plays chess with death to hold death off. He's, he keeps him busy with the chess game. And uh, 
And so that is that final iconic moment where, where death is leading them all away over the hill. The loop player is facing the wrong way, but he, he's going with them. And um, over time, the death art gradually became more skilled with more complex messages. Here's Bosch. He painted a deathbed scene. It's, you can read it this way as a scroll, right? In the bottom. This is what he used to be. He was a warrior and he had this armor. He was strong and then and here's clothes and he rich stuff and then he collected, he became a miser. He has these little devils, what my girls used to say. He has devils in his toy box, but that's not his toy box, that's his money box. And here he was looking, counting his money with all these little devils encouraging this fixation on cash. And here he is now at his deathbed, and uh, he, he has an angel here trying to get him to look up. There's a crucifix sending a tiny beam of light to him, and then a little devil coming over here, and here is death coming in the door. So death now, he's, he's, he's a, got a little, he's got a little arrow, I think, to get him with. But, and, um, and it's suggesting that Perhaps the sin of greed isn't worth the price. And all these pictures that were painted about the dance of death and the whole death theme all have a sub, you know, a text it, that you're supposed to be reading, tell, warning you, don't do that. This isn't a good idea. And over time, the dance of death sort of fizzled out and the focus narrowed down to death's ideal victim. Who would that be? A solitary woman. It's the lady. And she became more luscious and increasingly erotic down the centuries. And death, the skeleton or cadaver, slowly changed and took on living attributes. He's never exactly a man, but he's not, he's, he's male usually. And, um, but he still has something about him that tells you not human. And, but he's not a devil. This picture, I was really pleased with this picture. I thought, oh, look, it's showing her vanity and he's come to get her. But no, that's a devil. That's a devil. That's not death. That's not how they would have drawn it. So, uh, but she's very vain. She's wearing a push-up bra. And, uh, <laughs> and he's, he's very keenly interested, but he's not touching her. He's just standing there trying to, you know, admiring her, perhaps. Who knows? Um, so now we're going to watch this progress. Um, he's not touching her. It's very early, 13, you know, 13, 15 kind of time. Uh, he's menacing her with a bagpipe. But she, she, she doesn't. You know, he's not touching her. Then next is he's grabbed her. He's grabbed her, but he's still having a lot of fun. It's like, do you want to dance? He's got a nice hat or something. He's got some sort of snake jewelry and a really scary guitar. It is scary. And she's saying, oh my God, what's happening? But it's more like, it's not really frightening. It's just sort of comic. This guy is grabbing her. He's become enormously scary. Um, he now has male genitalia. He's, He's menacing her in a way that the dancing guys aren't. And so things are changing. He's become, he's become kind of brutal and, and more primitive and not cute. There's nothing cute about him. And so this next one is Hans Holbein, who made a living out of doing these little things of who, you know, he has a woman being carried away by death, a baby, he has the farmer, every, you know, the 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 priest, he just drew them all, and he, they were sold to give, war, tell people, don't do, don't do this. But this has death, also very flamboyant, in his hairdo, but uh, he's grabbed her clothing and is now dragging her. And uh, that is new. That's new. They were, didn't do that in the earlier ones. He's getting too familiar. And the hourglass time is running out. Oh, yes. Has he got an hourglass? Oh, down here. Yes, later he picks it up. But the, yeah, that's, that's the Greek chronos idea that, that he times up. And, uh, and later that becomes one of death's major um, accessories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then they get 
weirder and weirder. Here, this notice how lovingly her curves now have been painted so that you can see in the real picture, not drawn up here, but I don't know how well you can see this, but all she's just drawn in this loving way, but he's tying her up, which is a little bit weird, I think. And is he a man or is he a cadaver? He's, he's both. All of the skeletons have serious problems with their bones, <laughs> particularly around the pelvis. There seemed to be a very poor understanding of what a pelvis was. Sometimes it just looks like, you know, two chamber pots or, you know, whatever. It's just odd stuff. But this, this um, kind of different, this is a, another thing where he's really getting, starting to get too familiar. And around the time that this was there are other pictures of, uh, and there's one in, from a German manuscript, with death with his arms around the woman stuck inside of her dress. Um, and now, next one is, he's got his hands up her skirt. This is the pussy grab that we're all familiar with now. From the <laughs> and there, he's, and she is kind of, she's really not objecting. But it becomes the, the sort of subtext mm -hmm. of, of weird eroticism is getting right up there in the open now. What and kind of year is this one? Um, that one is, <laughs> it is 1520. Wow. So um, next one. Mm -hmm. OK, this one, mm -hmm. uh, all her clothes off now. She just has that little bit of drape. She's been, you know, really stripped down. This guy painted the same guy. He must have known a really ugly guy because he painted this over and over in different poses. Terrible things happening to these poor women, and it's always the same guy. He's sort of a rotting mess. And um, <laughs> but he's a kind of a sexualized cadaver. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So next is mm. here. This uh, really, I mean, what what an odd picture. This is. You couldn't sleep like that. She couldn't possibly be asleep like that. But it's death. Now he's got the hourglass again, and uh, he's got they're getting wings now. So he's getting. They're getting fancier about what in the world is this, and uh, that picture is is really making it clear that these pictures have become an excuse to paint naked ladies. <laughs> and that was what the Renaissance was all about, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and and, uh, and the death is starting to get it, get dooted up there. Okay, so in the following decades of increasingly less convincing art for me, the message became more and more complicated. And some artists sentimentalize the woman, so they make her real kind of oh, you feel sorry for her. And, or they make her body very tempting so you can't look at anything but that. Uh, all, but sometimes a woman is just very often just kind of a pallid victim with death as the main focus. And there was some attempt to make death super scary, but oftentimes that backfires. Next, um, here's one where they're supposed to be super scary. She's at the dressing table, all so vain, so fancy, and death is so He's so dooted up that you can't even tell what he's doing. And when you really look at it closely, it's an etching. And you can look at it very closely and see all the beautiful fine lines. But he just isn't scary. It's like silly almost. And um, by 1500, the plague had died down, or was dying down. It still was happening. But the TB was on the rise. And this gave that whole deathy theme a whole new lift and a new look. It, it, the dance of death was gone, but this death in the lady got a new chance, and the TB had hit Europe, and it was highly contagious. It was called the White Plague because it referred to how pale people seemed to get when they had tuberculosis. And TB prefers young bodies, and it prefers crowded conditions, and bad conditions of all sorts, and mortality rates with tuberculosis are incredibly shockingly high if it's not treated. And even with that, it's still a very difficult disease to manage. And as the Industrial Revolution start, came in, it drove rural people who might have lived in hovels, but at least they had fresh air and sunshine. And, but it drove them into the cities to seek jobs. And the urban housing conditions were the most gruesome of slums. And they became death traps for people. And uh, the new arrivals were poor. And they had no opportunity for or no understanding of hygiene. And practices like spitting on the street were commonplace. And that hand washing and covering your mouth and coughing as public health adjuncts that were 
a new ideas, and nobody really understood. You did it except for a couple of doctors who were talking about this. And those kind of simple precautions are still the first preventative step, even in our culture, of washing your hands and covering your mouth and your cough. And they're an important step in trying to eliminate tuberculosis, but they certainly weren't in common practice yet. And the high death rates among the young inspired this a huge resurgence of death in the maiden art forms. And in, in one year's time in Great Britain, there were something like four million deaths. Most of them were young people from tuberculosis during the worst year. And um, so it really did damage the sort of cultural fabric in the same way the plague had, although the plague took any age. But this young people were, are, are always TB's favorites. Um, anyway, Death in the Maiden got, dominated theater and poetry and music. And here's a modern thing, but it's showing that all, in the 1700s, 1800s, this became a popular theme. There's tons of wonderful music written about it. There are operas, there are operettas. The song itself that we sing tonight is sung, or at least the words are sung in some of these pieces of of theater, and uh, this is, I don't know, that's, it's a picture of this by Klimt, who's always exciting to look at, I think, but um, it shows that the, the lady really did, she left flat art and went into everything, and ladies were really gracefully and languidly kind of dying, and that became a socially popular and really romanticized concept. If you had a wan, pallid, big-eyed look, that was considered angelic and romantic and very attractive. So women powdered their faces so they would have this unearthly pallor, and it would look like they were dying of TB too, even mm -hmm. if they weren't. They would powder themselves up so they really looked like they were dying because it was such, such a, a romantic thing to do, really, wasn't it? And Death and the Lady Art from these years focused on very slender, ashen-looking women. And Death was often weirdly gentle at this time. And the women also started getting more clothes on again because there was, we were coming, pushing into a later, a later way of looking at a, a later kind of concepts about how women should be presented. But Death was also, even with the ladies' clothes, Death is presented as a seducer or a rapist, or some sort of murderous sneaking killer. And uh, the lady, always pale and languid, even when she was personified as death. Sometimes the, in a couple of paintings, the death becomes a lady, and she's dressed up, and now the black kind of things. But she always looks like she's got TB herself. So here's, good heavens. Yeah. <laughs> Death by Fusilli is an allegory, um, and um, it, this sort of, Language, yes, she's completely melted there, and she's. This is. A, he's a friend of Blake's, and uh, and I don't know what the horse is doing, or here's a little monster, but she's really, she's really just right for what we're talking about. The next one, this one. Look what it is. It's a shower curtain. Well, it wasn't right. painted as a shower curtain, but you can buy it online. <laughs> <laughs> Your own death in the lady shower curtain. <laughs> what a concept. Yeah. I just think that's a great it's by someone named Horace and Burnett, and it's from 1851. And you can also buy it as a yoga mat. Oh. <laughs> okay, now, we're really doing a lightning dash forward now. We're getting more modern. This is Ensor from 1893. And he makes death. You can't tell if you're looking at death. He's pretty rotted still. And the lady is looking like, oh my god. But you can't tell if it's just carnival stuff or an actual allegory. And I think for him it was both. Uh, party costumes and, and really scary. Um, here's Monk, uh, and he has, he, he was a man whose tuberculosis touched his life very sadly. He had a sister who died, his mother died of TB, and a number of female relatives who died of tuberculosis. And, uh, and so he has a lot of pictures of, of death getting the lady in the grip, and they're sort of dancing, and the lady is now going along with it. She's returning that kiss, and um, it's a change. She's reciprocating. 
So the next one, the woman sits up in bed, she's surprised. This is by a woman named Mary Ann Stokes in 1900, and death is a woman. And she's standing there by the bed, and she holds her hand up in a kind of comforting way to this woman who's frightened, and she's not touching her. And the, everybody's clothed, so this is a very different thing. But it has to do with this, the sort of, the, the victim is different than those early medieval ones. She's, she's a, a actual person, and death is now a person in this particular painting. This one's super creepy. Uh, death is a handsome young boy. He's an angel. He's got angelic wings. And he's really doing a job on her. The, this is a detail of a painting where all of his helpers are sort of tearing her away. And it's super embarrassing to look at if, with a moderate sensibility. I'm glad I found a detail and not the whole thing. <laughs> um, the next one is... Okay, for dead ladies, this is the ideal pose. Um, I use this in my cranky. You'll see when she's at the end, there's nothing to beat this pose for dead ladies. I think it's great. Uh, death is so shrouded up, you can't tell what the hell he is or who she is. But she's losing her flowers, she's losing it all. And uh, who knows what that means. Flowers usually had to do with virginity and stuff, so that's a weird statement. That's but not it, Persephone? Hmm? It's not Persephone with the flower. It might be, but some, it's not Pluto. It's 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 called Death and the, and the Maiden, so yeah. it could be whatever. You know, these these pictures, if you don't get what they're it's about, you just have to read the title, and then it tells you that <laughs> they're <laughs> on it still. And uh, the next one is by the guy Mosa in eighteen in nineteen oh six. He was a poster artist. Mm did a lot of beautiful sort of um, Art Nouveau posters, and he became a big fashion trend. So Death is kissing her, but the colors he used and all the things, the way he did women's hair, became high fashion. And the New Yorker just had an article about him not long, talking about, long ago, talking about what a, what a fashion setter he was. And the next one is the first time when you really see Death as the whole Grim Reaper, but now he's a, he's a ghost. It's a specter, but he's got, he's got Cronus's um, hourglass, and she's just, whoop, she's limp. Maybe she's already dead. Who could tell? But he's got his scythe. He's got all the paraphernalia, except that he's not black and scary anymore. He's just like... I don't know. And everybody's pretty languid. So along came World War One. It's it's right on the night of World War One, and Death is wearing very fancy shoes, like dance shoes, shiny dance shoes that look like they might have caps. And he's really got her tangoing. So we're back to that sort of idea that maybe this is going to be fun. Um, and he's Death's kind of becoming cool for a little while. The next one is a favorite painting of mine. It's so weird. It's by Egon Schiele, is that how you say his name? 1916, excuse me. He was on the eve of his World War I conscription. And his girlfriend, he was breaking up with her, and gonna, he goes off and marries somebody else and goes off to the war. And here's this weird thing. She has this very, her arm is caught in his clothing, but it doesn't, you have to look closely to see that. It just looks very weird. And they're on the sheet outside, and there's sort of faces in the rocks over here. And he looks despairing, and it's called Death and the Lady, but Death is now a man, but not exactly a man. It, it, you know, and she's, nobody's getting any pleasure out of this particular event. It was just a, a sad sort of World War One thing. Okay, then we have the Roaring Twenties coming in, and these sort of pictures, you know, sort of, I think in the Roaring Twenties people were desperate to be unusual, and so this guy, his name, what's his name? Franz Fiedler, 1921, he painted, did photographs, lots of photographs of women in rather compromising poses with, with a skeleton. And uh, they get pretty tiresome after looking at a few dozen of them. <laughs> and then, the last one, Kathy Colwitz, Colwitz, and that's called Young Girl, and the young girl is in the arms of death. And she was drawing at the time of the Great Depression when there really was major hunger and lots of disease and problems in, in, in Germany and her part of the world and all over Europe. And so post-World War II comes along, I'm going to rush through, and this is Australian, Donald Friend, done in 1949. And he has death 
gripping these nice buns. Um, he was a man who got in a lot of trouble for his own sexual proclivities, but he was a good painter and got a lot of awards for his paintings. But ultimately, his own behavior uh, was undid it. Okay, the next one is a very strange and sad thing uh, by Joseph Boyce, and it, it's painted on a, it's called Death and the Lady, or Death and the Maiden, and it's painted on an envelope which has the seal on it of an organization of Auschwitz survivors. Wow. And so now the focus of death is what he could do in those camps. And the lady, this is death, this is the lady, she's almost mushed away to being no more than what he is. And it's a, it's a strange and powerfully painful picture, mainly because of that envelope. And then there's a guy from India. He was the first post-independence Indian artist to achieve high recognition in the West. And his name's Francis Newton Souza. And his death in the lady is pretty standard. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's very much painted in the style of the times, but it's the same sort of, same sort of feeling of, of something icky going on. <laughs> and uh, the next one is a British painter, and here we have he was a very skilled and popular painter. His critics didn't like him. His behavior was terrible. He had something like 12 children by all of his models. And uh, it, it was, his behavior was, he had lots and lots of curls and hair dressed up like the 60s kind of look. He paints death always as a seducer and a rapist and very menacing. He often makes it as repulsive as possible. And the woman is always this limp form, kind of limp, and then death is hanging over her, kind of that, what she's absorbed, like that. And the next one is also by him, and this is just death, the woman, I don't know if she's in this picture at all, but it's, or she's moving, he's moving toward her, it's just a detail, but death is this bunch of slime, and yucky, 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 icky, and uh, it's just, it's repulsive to look at, and you're very lucky this is such poor... <laughs> Poor quality here because you don't have to see all that shine and get nightmares. Um, United States, Fritz Scholder, uh, he was a Native American postmodernist, did pop art and stuff, the Indian guy and wrapped in the flag. You probably remember these. He was very popular uh, and won a lot of acclaim in the 1980s. And here's death is the, it's called Death and the Lady, but there's just the lady, and then this strange sort of whoosh here, which, and I, I really like that picture because it's, it's, I'm so grateful that it doesn't show any gripping. <laughs> <laughs> and um, then with the next one is a Serbian performance artist, and she did the same thing that Fiedler did in the 20s. She has her, that's her dancing and her performance, but she had herself being tumbled around the floor with a skeleton, and um, that was very, very like the Fiedler, Fiedler work of the 20s, and that was from 2007. And then another American, Nicole Eisenman, uh, she, this is her death and the lady, death and the maiden. And so you have this, they're drinking together, and she won the, a MacArthur because she returned to painting images when everybody else was doing abstract work and nobody painted representational work. And she did, and this was it and these sort of strangely expressionistic portraits. And that's, the, that's Death and the Lady. And, and, uh, and then the other, there's a very, that's by a man named uh, Philip Lynch. He is an artist and it also illustrates children's books. And the children's books are lovely little villages and you know sweet little towns. And then you have these really scary, very detailed pictures of, of death. Sort of, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then the last one is. Oh. 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 This is by a guy named 
lift your giraffes and your pâtés. And uh, it's just from 2016. And um, he does a lot of political art, but he's also considered a serious artist, even with his political art. And uh, it's very respected. And that was mine from years ago. I just couldn't decide. I guess obviously I wasn't thinking much about anything. She's hanging on to him, but she's also hanging on to the boyfriend over here who's alive. So she clearly hasn't made up her mind which way to go. But she's got sexual titties anyway. And um, so um, that was my pitiful effort. And now it's time to see the cranky and the ballad about making bargains to avoid seemingly unavoidable situations. have been a, stories have been a lifelong interest. And I wanted to see, at last, you could have a work of art that would tell the whole story, not just a little moment, not just, not just the wolf talking to Little Red Riding Hood in this one little moment. You have the whole story. So that's very intriguing to me. And um, how are the lights? Are they looking OK? Yeah. Yeah. I have to stand up here and let me tighten this up. Baggy. It's paper, and so it has many baggy flaws. Um, I, it also makes a crinkly noise, which I like very much. As she walked down one day, one day, she met an aged man along the way. His head was bald, oh, his beard was gray. His clothing made of cold earth and clay. His clothing was made of the cold earth and clay. She said, oh man, what man are you? What land, what country do you belong to? And why should I, oh, a lady fine, why should I give you, give you my time? Oh, why should I give you, give you my time? Do you not know me, I'll tell you then? I conquer all the sons, the sons of men. And you, dear lady, one upon that tree. Yes, you, fair lady, must come along with me. Oh, you, fair lady, must come along with me. I've heard of you time after time. But being in the glory of my prime, I did not think you would have come so soon. Why must my morning sun go down at noon? Why must my morning sun go down at noon? I'll give you gold, I'll give you pearls, I'll give you costly rich robes to wear If you will grant me oh a little while Just give me time my life to amend 
Oh, give me time, my life, to amend. I want no gold, I want no pearls, I want no costly rich robes to wear, and I'll not grant you no a little while, a little while your life to amend. No, I'll not give you a time your life to amend. But, sir, there's many with snowy heads and aching joints from whom all joy has fled. Take them whose sorrows, sorrows are so deep, and spare my life until a later day. No, I'll not spare your life until a later day. Fair lady, lay vain works aside. No longer glory, glory in your pride. No more in life, oh, may your body stay. Your time is come and you must away. Your time is come and you must away. And so it was that lady died. Let this be on my tombstone, she cried. Here lies a poor, poor, deserted maid, who in her beauty life's taken away. Her clothing is made of the poor earth and clay. Her clothing is made of the cold earth and clay. <laughs> does give me the prerogative to talk about it. But this ballad is about death. And, and right. so I'm interested in, in medieval in medieval songs. Uh -huh. And this one particularly interested me because it's beautiful to me. It's uh -huh. a, I think it's a beautiful song and it's really interesting to sing. And it happens to be about death. So what is I can't change that. <laughs> Other ballads I've done I all, all of the ballads that I know practically involve yeah. some sort of catastrophe. Yeah. They didn't weren't interested in ballads that weren't about disasters or catastrophes or boats sinking or exactly. something. Yeah. And, uh, and the I lot of them I've known all my life, and so I'm interested in them. I, yeah. You know. and, and you talked about bargains, the bargains that we make. And the bar and so the bargains aren't worth anything. Death comes up for us when death comes for us. Yeah, but we still bargain. Yeah, <laughs> and sometimes we still people. Think we can yes, do I, I I did have a friend who had a cancer and was dying, and she made the bargain. She wanted to see her kids into high school, and that she lived that long that she mm -hmm. got to see her kids into high school, and that bargain. When it was fulfilled, that was enough for her, and she died very peacefully. Uh -huh. But she wasn't peaceful before that. She fought uh -huh. to uh -huh. see this come true. And so it's not everybody who gets the bargain that they want, but it is interesting that we do that. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and that it just seems to be our way of dealing with it, it otherwise impossible situations. <coughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I like these guys. I mean, they are very deathy, but. Oh, they're beautiful dancers. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah. Some of them, this one has very long finger bones, but I got carried away. Yeah. <laughs> they're like castanets. That's why you spent time looking at um, Mexican Day of the Dead art? Yes, I have. Yeah. Yeah. How would you say it's different or similar? It's very different in the sort of sensibility of it. 
they're, theirs are, are, they're more exuberant in a lot of ways. They're strong in a way that often these little, a lot of these are blow-ups from tiny drawings in manuscripts. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but yeah, they're, I don't know how, they're just different. They are different. They look like they're from a different, a different sensibility. Mm -hmm. And it, it's certainly the Day of the Dead is a, a, a really still a strong way to see how that culture, they have songs that, that go with that celebration. And, and uh, I remember once in Mexico when I was young, being taken to a graveyard on Day of the Dead, and people had, they, they had boards on the graves that they lifted off, and they had huge picnics and huge family members, and then they were putting food on the grave, and someone was pouring Fanta onto the ground and shouting, well, grandfather, this wasn't invented when you were here, but I think you'll like it. <laughs> it, was, it was astonishing to me, but not really, not, uh, you know, I thought it was kind of a nice way of, of dealing with, with, your, with your dead, because we don't really have a satisfactory way of doing of doing that, I think. You know, they're, they're gone and forgotten for us, or not forgotten, but if they're, you know, my mother used to live in southern Indiana, and now she lives in my head. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a, it's a different sort of thing. You learned the songs mostly from your mother? Well, they were I, down, or? I didn't learn this one from my lover. My lover, I learned it from my lover. <laughs> I <laughs> learned it from my mother. I learned a lot of songs from my mother, yeah. and many, many more from my sister Charlotte, who's two and a half years older and got out of the house early and off to music events. Mm -hmm. And we grew up in a very richly musical part of the country. In those days, everywhere was richly musical. I mean, as I went into high school, you didn't go to a party without an instrument going along. You carry, everyone carried their instruments everywhere, and everything was, it was all about singing and all about music. And so I learned a lot of songs during those years. But I learned an awful lot from my sister Charlotte. And, uh, and I still sing with her. With Mark recently, we, we, she, we, I was singing with her on the telephone. You know, she, we're doing harmonies on the phone. <laughs> Only she's making lots of strange musical sounds too, because I don't know what she was playing, but it sounded like a didgeridoo going on there. <laughs> but it wasn't because she was singing. But yeah, that's been a hugely important part of, of, of our lives. And so this, for me, even though I, you know, I don't, it's, I don't think the voice, my voice doesn't matter to me, how I sound or how I sing, it's a song that I want that song to have another chance to be heard. I mean, it's been fun for 700 years, mm -hmm. probably. And, um, mm -hmm. and that, that, to me, is really touching. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for taking us through the art of this subject. Taking us through the art and showing us all the things. <laughs> Wasn't that grim? <laughs> <laughs> I did it, though. We did it. Yeah. Yeah, that was the dash. but. But yeah, it's, it's an interesting way of, for me, it was a surprisingly interesting way of looking. I never had thought about that before. You know, if I were going to draw death, I don't think I would do any of those things, but they certainly would be in my head as being acceptable ways of drawing death because I, because we've all seen these pictures. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't think that when I die, I will have that experience. <laughs> but I think those people did think they would. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there a cheerful note we can leave? <laughs> talk, talk about your evolution of the cranky. Have you painted the, the front of it again in a different manner? I, I saw your first one show that was down at the uh, art gallery, the wood you know, yeah. art gallery and stuff. Did you redo that? I no, think. it's just diff the lighting in here is stronger yeah, and you can see it. Very more um, how, yeah, many, the, how many reels have you done? Yeah. Well, I did some in the old days that were painted on Tyvek. So oh. Nobody should ever do that. It takes paint and it all flaked off and was really oh. ugly looking. And I liked it a lot, but it never got, sh they, those oh. never got shown. They're, they're, um, well, that's not true. They I, don't have I, the, I put the them around. I had an art show and once and put them around the top, like a freezer around the top oh. of the gallery. Uh -huh. But they were they um, 
I never had a cranky box until Andy and Carolyn built me a cranky box. Oh, and this yeah. is it. And then the same time they built me that, then somebody gave me that monster downstairs that's in that little room. And it weighs a ton. You can't, you have to burrow back in there to get it. It's very uncomfortable to work with and doesn't behave. And this is just a simple and lovely, uh -huh. lovely piece of work, this, this cranky box. And yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate your, your singing this um, because, you know, for most of the history of people and music, the only way you heard music was if somebody sang it or played yeah. it. Yeah. And now we're so used to getting everything on a, yeah, out of a box and That's out true. of a speaker. Yeah. And even when it's live through an amplification. Mm -hmm. And we, we've so lost that. It's just wonderful to Thank catch you. a piece of this again. And, and, and not a movie star or uh, uh, not a real singer, but just a person. <laughs> <laughs> a person who just doesn't. Yes. Yeah. Person yeah, that's is rare. a real singer. Hmm? A person is a real singer. Yeah. Well, we're all real singers. Every, every everyone is. I, yes. You know, I'm not a professional musician by a long no. shot. But in the old days, the persons who sang this wouldn't have either. This was right. this kind of singing was the evening's entertainment. There was no TV and this mm -hmm. kind of songs, they liked these awful ballads because they were like so pop. Right. Mm -hmm. And they sat around and they never seemed to get tired of hearing them. Although I remember when I was a kid with Barbara Allen, did I ever get tired of hearing that? <laughs> never. I never got tired of it. It was always uniquely beautiful and interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the thing. There is a fascination with death. And if you go to the Helen Harkness Flanders collection at Middlebury College, so many of those ballads have to do with death. People loved it. People yeah. still love it. It's a big mystery, isn't it? Yeah. 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 And very personal. Yeah. I guess to each. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.